A couple of things I want to say before we get into God's Word this morning. First of all, uh, I made copies of this uh, handout from Dr. Adrian Rogers that Brother Ed Hampton spoke about last week. He mentioned in his closing sermon. Now, this is a good for every Christian to read through also. How to be saved and know it. You really can know that you're eternally saved and on your way to heaven. So, well, I'm a church member. I wonder if I'm saved. Uh, pick up a copy of this if you if, if you didn't last week uh, after after service. And or you said I'll make all the copies that we need, guys. This is a really good little pamphlet that'll tell you about how to lead someone else to Jesus and to make sure that you have a true faith in Jesus Christ. Because Satan likes to beat us up on that. Say, am I really saved? Well, this right here, as you read through this, is God's Word will hopefully give you an assurance. Second, I want to say thank you to the couple of first responders that we do have coming out and, I, and the choir for singing all these songs that's related to this subject, pass it on, being better witnesses, being faithful to God. I know that God will truly bless you men. And... Uh, and I'm going to say this to the ladies in our church. I know that you prepared a lot for finger foods and things. Look, guys, we prepared as if all 50 that have been invited are 51. Uh, and so we have a certificate for everyone and a couple of gifts. Uh, the gifts, actually, Brother Mike got uh, really nice little prayer books for first responders. And then he put a $50 Walmart card in both of them. We were going to do a drawing, but guess what, guys? You're the automatic winners. So, uh, so good for you, yes. And we're still going to recognize you at the end of service, ask you to come forward, and we'll present that to you at certificates. And then hopefully we'll find a way to get the certificates to the other people. I know that the, uh, I call them the, uh, with a natural resource officer for our county, I called him yesterday. He had to be out of state. He was actually driving when I talked to him. And I told him that, you know, we certainly would miss him, but he, he wants to come and be, be with us. So hopefully he'll come the last Sunday of this month and be with us if he doesn't have to work. So, you know, I mean, not really to be recognized. He just wants to come and be part of our fellowship. And I appreciate it. I appreciate it talking to him. Uh, but uh, this morning we are recognizing our local heroes and first responders. I want to say, first of all, thank you to Brother Tony. I know he put, I, I would say, close to 90 miles on his vehicle driving to Welch and different parts of the Bradshaw and different parts of the county, uh, getting the list of names for our state troopers, our county sheriffs, the local uh, mayor, clerks, and all that stuff here, the fire responders, EMS. I mean, he, he did a lot of work. Thank you, Brother Tony. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And we do have first responders in our church, men that have served in, in different responsibilities in the, the local fire departments, either here or, or elsewhere, and, and uh, are in the, as the law enforcement. We certainly appreciate them also. All right, so where do you go to for a first responder's message? Well, here's where I went to. I thought there's some really good first responders in the Bible. There's a story of Abraham. Abraham's son, uh, nephew Lot, he doesn't have any children at this time, he and Sarah don't. Abraham's nephew Lot and all of Lot's family are kidnapped. That's right, they were kidnapped, carried away. And Abraham becomes a responder and rescues not only them, but many people that had been carried away by this marauding force. And God blessed him for that. Joseph was used to save Egypt, but also to save the nation of Israel. In fact, the nation of Israel then just had 70-some people in it. And so, and Israel was still alive, uh, his father. Esther, what a hero of the Bible Esther is. She puts her own life on the line, like the responders do. Most of the people that Esther saved, she never knew them, never saw their face, never knew who they were. But she did it out of just love for what God had called her to do. And I appreciate the attitude of these men here today. However, I'm going to look at what I think is probably the most famous first responder in the Bible. 
If not, at least it's the one that Jesus talked about. So open with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 25. We don't see our hero until we get down to verse 33. But we'll start in verse 25 because that's where the story starts. Chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 25. Now, uh, the reason I say that this may be the most famous first responder in the world, large organizations are named after this man, but we don't know his name. You have Samaritan's Purse, which our church just gave a $1,000 or $1,500 donation to the other day to help with the people in Maui, uh, Franklin Graham's organization, named after this, the Samaritan. You have the Good Sam's Club, of RVs, which is the not just the U.S., it's the largest international group of, <laughs> of RV owners, good, good Samaritan Club, to look out for each other on the highway. So, so this guy's famous. I wonder if some people even know why they call them that. But it's, almost every state, I know at least 38 states, have good Samaritan laws. West Virginia does. If you help someone that's beside the road and they happen to pass, uh, the families can't sue you because you were actually trying to provide aid to them, you know. So, so guys, this guy is pretty famous, and we don't even know his name. So let's start. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, tempted Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I'm going to read, go ahead and read a few verses. He said unto him, this is Jesus talking, what is written in the law? How readest thou, thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now, you say, well, did he come up with that? No, that's in the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. You know, loving your neighbor as yourself, not just something Jesus said, it's in the law of God uh, 2,000 years, or 1,400 years before Christ was born. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast answered right. It's a righteous answer. This do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself, because now he's starting to feel guilty, because he knows no one has ever lived up to the law. No one could ever be saved by the law. The law revealed that what our sin was. So like most people, he wanted to justify himself, said unto Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> Let's stop right there for a minute. Who is my neighbor? So, this certain lawyer, let's go verse by verse through this. He, uh, he stands up. Now, don't think about a lawyer like uh, Morgan, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Megan Eastep, Morgan from our church. Don't think about her. Don't think about Perry Mason, okay? This lawyer is not a lawyer for the law. He is someone that studied the law of Moses. He was a theologian, an expert in the word of God. And he's testing Jesus to see if this itinerant preacher that's telling people the, that they can be saved by believing in him, he's putting him to the test. Tempted him, the King James says. Putting him to the test. But the question he asked is the greatest question that anybody has ever asked in the history of mankind. It's a question that all of us have asked ourselves. Especially if you know Christ as Savior, you ask yourself, how can I be saved? And someone shared the gospel with you. and You believed in Jesus Christ, had your sins washed away. Maybe you've asked that question and you still have not come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's the greatest question any person will ever ask. And Jesus gives a perfect answer, of course, because he's a perfect man. What does the Word of God say? Because it never matters what does the preacher say unless they're saying what God's Word says. It doesn't matter what the church members say. It matters what does the Word of, Word of God say. Today, we know the Word of God, don't we? We have the completed Bible. They only had what we call the Old Testament, what they would just call the Scripture, the Bible, the Word of God. The Bible just means the book. But we have the completed Bible, so we know this. What does the person have to do to be saved? Well, we know that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Guys, I suppose most of us learned this when we were 10 or 12 years old, Romans' road to salvation, how to share with our friends to be saved. 
Then Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's still the best plan, the best way I know to explain to anybody. If, if somebody comes to me and they say, how can I be saved? I say, well, let's look at Romans Road. Let's look, look at, you know you're lost. You let that doesn't take much convincing. They know that. If it does, I always ask them this same question. I'm going to ask their first responders this question. So you guys answer me, okay? How many cars do you have to steal to be a car thief? That's exactly right. I guarantee you the police thinks it's one, okay? You say, I just stole one car. I want to be a Mercedes. I thought I don't really want to work for it. I just drive and steal somebody else's car. You know what? The police call you a car thief. You know how many sins you got to sin to be a sinner? Just one, same answer. But God gives us a gift to be saved. Then going on with Romans Road, in chapter 10 it says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you might get saved. No, 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 it don't say that. It says, thou shall be saved. Not hope you're saved, not hope maybe someday you No, no, you shall be saved from your sins. And that's good news, guys. But with the information that this guy has, he gives a good answer. And Jesus even said, that's the right answer, you know. Uh, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And then go beyond that and love other people as you love yourself because we do love ourselves. I mean, I could put my glasses on here and see that you love yourself. Yep. Yeah. Everybody here calm their heart today. All right. See, you're already heading a little bit there, you know. You love yourself. No, you care for yourself. Well, the Bible says love your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus said, that's the right answer. You do this and you shall live. The only problem is, you'll see in verse 29, this guy knew that he couldn't do that. And neither can you. Nobody can keep the law of God. The law of God is called in the New Testament, it's called a mirror. So I like to use this illustration quite often. Any of y'all, any of y'all ever had little kids between the ages of say 5 and 11? Raise your hand, let me see here. Alright, guys. We, all of us know this then, don't we? No matter how clean you get them, you can put them in a clean room and turn around two minutes later. How do they do it? They're filthy again. It's like some kind of miracle or something. Well, you don't take them in there and say, look in this mirror. Oh, I'm nasty. Well, you don't wash the mirror, do you? Well, they still be filthy dirty. That's how stupid it is to think you can go to heaven because you're good. You know what the biggest religion in McDowell County is? I wish it was Baptist or Pentecostals or Methodist or something. The biggest religion in McDowell County is good old boyism. Okay. I'm a good boy. Listen, I work all the time. I don't drink near as much as my cousin does. I don't hardly ever beat my wife. I love my kids most of the time. I mean, you know that. I'm a pretty good old boy. Or at least, I may not be the best old boy, but measured to him, I'm pretty good, you know. But you know what? Even if you was the best guy in McDowell County, you'd die and go to hell. And that's what this guy's learned. That's what this lawyer is learning right now, this expert of the law of God. <clears throat> so what's he trying to do? Verse 29, he tries to justify himself by changing it around and saying, let's get the heat off me, who is my neighbor. Okay, now let's <clears throat> go look at the rest of it now. <clears throat> verse 30 through verse 35. I'm going to read all of it, and then we'll go back and talk about it. And Jesus answered, said, you want to know who your neighbor is? A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell uh, among thieves. Now you go down there because uh, Jer uh, Jerusalem is about 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho is the lowest sea level of any city in the world, okay? Sometimes Damascus says they are, but they're, they're, both of them are 800 feet below sea level. So in just about 17 miles, you drop 3,100 feet, okay? So it's, it's a very narrow path. I've been there. And seen the path, but and, and people still travel it usually for fundraisers. Somebody said, I'm going to take the Jericho Road. And our bus driver said that when he was in high school, they did that, I guess, for their sports teams. They would take the Jericho Road and it would you know, raise money like a walkathon, you know. So it's a very dangerous road, even today. There's, it's, it, it's not something you drive, it's something that you walk. And he fell among thieves. Now, not, not, not good. And, and, and the King James really doesn't get this word right. It's not. Thieves, it's the word robbers. Now you say, what's the difference? 
Well, we call somebody that sneaks and steals something, we call them a sneak thief. But have you ever heard anybody call anybody, say, we had a, a bank thief in our day. No, no, bank robbers, because it was violent. It was, so that's, we still make that English difference in our language today. The Greeks did too. This is a Greek word, he fell among robbers. We stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, <clears throat> there came down a certain priest. Wow, he's in good shape now. Here comes a first responder. That way. <clears throat> and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Hmm. So much for the religious dude, wasn't it? Comes down, sees him there. Probably if he's coming from, I don't know which way he's going, but it's, it's, it says it's, it came down. So I'm assuming he's coming from Jerusalem too. So he, he's finished his priestly duties. He's coming down, and I know some of y'all want to make excuses for him, don't you? Well, maybe he was afraid that thieves were still around. Maybe this was just a decoy thief, and he had ketchup all over him. And when I stopped to help, you, you can make all the excuses you want to for this priest, this pastor, this preacher. He had no excuse. Let's keep going. Likewise, a Levi. That's the... Uh, from the same tribe as the priest, but this will be someone that worked in the temple precincts. He was a man of God, but not a priest, but he worked in religious things all of his life. When he was at the place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. At least he came closer to him and looked down on him. But a certain Samaritan, I can almost hear the crowd in Jesus' day is going, boo, boo. They hate, they hate Samaritan. Samaritans are half-breeds. You remember when Jesus is witness to a Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John? She said, what are you doing talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Y'all don't talk to us. We don't talk to you. A lot of racial prejudice there. <clears throat> but Jesus is using, and I don't know that this is a parable that doesn't say that anywhere that it is. So maybe this is someone that Jesus knew or maybe this had happened many times. I don't know. But Jesus said, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and we saw him he had compassion on him this man is going to become the first responder even though two other responders have already came by this man is going to respond and he went to him bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine which he had no doubt saved for himself as he's traveling you know to have stuff for his own needs Set him on his own beast, so this man had a certain amount of money. So he set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. But that's not all. And on the next day, on the morrow, when he part, departed, he took out two pence. That would be about today $430. So he takes out some money to help pay for this. And gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more on him than this, when I come again, I will repay you. Wow, that's pretty cool. Isn't it? So if it ends up costing more than four hundred and some dollars, when I come back, I'll take it. Now, you could probably trust this guy to be true to his word because they say he's taking the beast, he's going on, he's not a criminal. He takes the money out, he has enough money in his bag to pay this debt. Now, <clears throat> that's the end of our story. Now we're going to go back to where we started with the lawyer and Jesus. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he, this is the lawyer, the student of the law said, he that showed mercy on him. Do you notice, Ray, he doesn't even say the Samaritan. Huh? A Jewish lawyer could not even hardly say that word and they're all shocked that Jesus would come out of his lips. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus came to die for Samaritans. He came to die for everyone, no matter what their case is. And I think about these guys sitting back here. When they get a call to go out and respond to something, they don't say, are they good people? The house we're going to, are they good people or are they bad people? Uh, are, are they uh, people that can help us or people that can't help us or whatever? You know, guys, these first responders, when they get the call, they go out. I know because after church last night, when I came out, there were two responders. First responders sitting there said, we've come to cut a tree off the power lines. 
And they told us it was up River Bend Road. And my brother-in-law both and I both said at the same time, well, you're at Riverview Road. <laughs> I know they sound a lot like, so we'll drive, because that's where we live. We live on River Bend Road. And uh, the tree was down. And, you know, so they didn't say, I wonder if these are good people, if these are mean people, you know. He didn't, this guy didn't talk to it. This is a Jewish man laying there in Jesus' story. But this Samaritan, what's it say? Has mercy on him. So I guess to answer that guy's question, here's where we're going to close. We'll close up in just three or four minutes here. Is this right here. It's not, who is my neighbor? The question really is, who can I be a neighbor to? And that's still our question. Because you say, I oh, don't know, I don't say that way. I ain't finished reading yet. The coach is going to go on down here through verse 37. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, and to every one of you sitting here today, go and do thou likewise. Literally in the Greek it says, go and keep on doing likewise thou do. Well, it's kind of, kind of, I like how the King James translates it better, but in the Greek, it's, it's really powerful. Don't quit doing this yourself. Guys, this is good examples for us. <coughs> we need to show mercy. You know, that's something even higher than being a neighbor. To show mercy to strangers. To reach out a helping hand to someone that's in need. I couldn't help but make this connection. I, in fact, I've never heard the Good Samaritan preached on that somebody didn't make this connection. Jesus, of course, is a perfect example of all of this. You know what Jesus did when he was in heaven? He came down to earth where we are. And he didn't just look at us and turn his back on us. He paid the price for us. He paid the price. Isn't that really nice? I sometimes wonder if, it, in fact, I, I honestly, I pray this, and I know that I'm not expecting y'all to pray like me. I'm just saying, I pray this at least once a day. God, two things I pray. Help me not to be like me, and help me to be like Jesus. And I pray this too. God, help me never to quit being amazed that you died in my place. That is an amazing thing, that the God of heaven loved us enough to pay the price for our sins. He died in our place on Calvary. And just like this good Samaritan, <clears throat> he gives something to pay the debt, and then he said, I'll be passing by this way again. And that's what I look forward to more than anything, Jesus coming back again to get us. Hallelujah. All right. I want to ask if Carlo would come back to the panel. We're going to sing, uh, how many verses of that song? How many? Two. We'll sing both verses of this song. If you're here today and you don't know Christ the Savior, now, I don't care if you're a member of this church. I don't care if you're one of our deacons. If you don't know Jesus today, today's a good day to be saved. Today's a good day to say, I want to follow that Roman's road. I know I'm a sinner. And I want Jesus to wash my sins away. Let's stand together. We'll sing both verses, and then we're going to recognize these when we come. <clears throat>
the old death angel knocks on your door, you'll be ready to go. You'll be ready to go.